Well, good, good morning, everybody. Um, so basically, I'm Paul, um, and for the past couple of years, I've been running with a friend, Andrew Back. Uh, I said running. Uh, we've been organising a monthly meetup called Oshug, which is the open source hardware user group. And I would just say it's like one of a number of meetups that are happening in London. London's really hot for meetups. The other one's the IoT meetup that I would suggest you go to if you're interested in hardware, uh, which Ken is involved with as well. And last one, we I think we had about 100 and something people, and you had to move venues because you overflowed a plug. Um, this Dorkbot, they they meet um, at no notice at all. Uh, Can I be a real twat? Yeah. Bagels have arrived, and the salt beef department is going to go. Oh, fine, thank you. So, so that. Yeah, yeah, just let me, just, just, I'll just ramble on, and you, yeah, 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 okay, so, so, look up to, so, um, so basically, there's loads of stuff going on in London, it's really hot topic, and, um, so I've been trying to sort of get my head around, you know, what open source hardware is, and, um, I had an attempt at sort of, um, well, myself and Andrew, who have been running the group, had an attempt at sort of trying to do a GitHub for electronics, and, uh, before I get to that, I'll probably talk a little bit about, what the obstacles are to get a world where you can get hardware into a GitHub kind of environment. Should I just hold off for a minute, or are you? Well, I'm yeah. listening. Okay, okay, it's great. So, okay, so um, I, I should emphasize that though this is, I'm talking about a couple of years, and open source hardware, I think is a fairly, fairly new term. Um, open hardware has been going forever, and Bruce Perrins is worth looking up. I, know, I mean, he's well known in the open source Software arena, he's like a, a lawyer who represents Amazon and Google. Um, but he, he's been involved in something called Tapper. And this is like an open source radio ham type thing. It's been going forever. And they've had, um, actually, they've had open source uh, satellites and uh, lots of software defined radio. Completely bonkers stuff. Really hard to actually engage with. It's just so geeky. Um, more recently, I guess we had the Maker's Bill of Rights from the Make magazine, which was really just, just sort of trying to get into the, the idea that, um, you know, it's, it's ironic for me to say it's you know, presenting from a MacBook Air, but the idea of, you know, screws, not glue, you know, stuff you can get onto that's got a longevity beyond the manufacturer's intentions are really important. And um, so just to give you an idea of the scale of this kind of stuff, it's sort of, you know, we've had satellites, there's an open source car, this is actually uh, by a company in the UK uh, called River Simple. And uh, like many kind of um, open source projects, they have a separate foundation which owns the designs of the car. And um, you know, the motivations for this are quite, are quite apparent. You know, imagine trying to deal with an industry that's sort of, um, I mean, I, I gather a Golf today is actually less efficient than one from 10 years ago. Um, you know, this industry is sort of like definitely needs disruption. So a good way to disrupt it is to, to go open source. And, um, and the re the re one of their big motivations is that actually, um, you know, there's no kind of commoditized components in cars. You know, you know it's like with your car when you go to buy a new exhaust. It's not just like what year is it or what model is it. It's like, you know, it could be 10 different types of exhaust for one month of manufacture. And so just by trying to sort of uh, open source designs, you're trying to sort of get other people to use the same parts that you're using and try and create a marketplace uh, which you can then build up on and do interesting things. And, um, and this is happening in lots of new technologies, you know, to, to walk, go from Amy, you know, there's um, an open source wind turbine uh, in Arwe, which is well funded, and um, their designs are online. And, you know, big companies like Facebook, um, I guess most people know about open compute. Chris is a good person to talk to about open compute, actually. He's now got a mouthful of sandwich. Um, but Facebook, you know, um, to try and sort of improve, I mean, the, although data centers are important to Facebook, it's not kind of what they're selling, you know, it's just like, you know, compliments what they do. So it makes total sense to make that a commodity and actually, actually use open source to get other people to, to share their designs and contribute it back. And they claim to have, you know, one of the world's most efficient data centers as a result of this project. Um, and CERN, you know, is another good example of why companies do open source hardware. CERN, the, the, a lot of the hardware in the Hadron Collider is open source. You could build a Hadron Collider in the comfort of your own back garden, <laughs> if you're so inclined. But the reason for that is obvious, because you can imagine how nuts it must be, a multinational organization, a federation of all these different scientists. Last thing we'll do is deal with is contracts and NDAs and blah. So just putting the, you know, the, the, the designs for the, the Hadron Collider on a... I think it's on a Redmine website, and just saying, build that, 
and then going out for tender through that. It just, just removes a lot of bureaucracy. And then similarly, like um, uh, Google recently, you know, wants to sort of foster people to build accessories for Android. So what they did was they took an existing open source hardware, um, the, Ar the Arduino, uh, and try and say Android and Arduino interchangeably for a while, you get very confused. But basically what they did was they said, okay, well, you know, you can build stuff with, an with uh, Arduino. I guess everybody here knows about Arduino, it's, it's a well-known thing. Um, and you know, they just basically tweaked the design for Arduino, they didn't ask, ask anybody's permission to do that because it's open source. Um, just so you could shove two sort of male um, USBs together, or I should say master. Male's not a very politically correct thing to talk about these days, is it? But, um, you know, and, and the consequence of that was because Google said, okay, here's this design, uh, their initial sort of uh, thing they published at their conference was very expensive, uh, laughably so. I think it was like $200 for their, their, their you know, um, ADK board. But within weeks, um, lots of small sort of kitchen table manufacturers have built their own versions. Um, and you know, you can get one for like $30 now. I think the Seed Studio one is about $30. Um, and of course, that's good for Google, and it's good for us. Um, and so one of the, the kind of obstacles, I guess, you know, if you want to start contributing, you want to fork the open source car and contribute back. You probably need some real serious kit, like you know lathes and uh, mini machines and blah. And so the way that that's sort of being addressed is lots of sort of um, kind of um, local manufacturing stuff going on. So there's hack space and hacker space. Um, oh crumbs! Uh, if you want to see, you know, like you know um, the kind of Monty Python, you know, people's front of Judea, Judea is people's front. Just go and you know mention the wrong hack space pronunciation to somebody. And you'll have fun, but um, but basically there, there are places like this is a noise bridge in San Francisco. We have the hack space in London, which is amazing when you think they've actually got a building in this part of London, quite expensive to get get space, and they have a large number of subscribers. You know, bringing that up, and it's a good place to go and you know meet the warm bodies of the nutcases. And the government sort of um, is doing um, s some stuff in in the UK. There's a fab lab in Manchester where I believe they have a, a, a day a week where you can go along and use some real heavy duty stuff. And this is great because um, we're starting to see some real sort of um, meaningful projects, you know, you know blossoming from that. Uh, the Open Ecology um, uh, project is basically building a, kick, a Kickstarter kit, 50 projects you would need to start an ecology. So if you want to actually turn, you know, uh, a subsistence, subsistence level sort of economy into something that's got manufacturing, you know, 3D printers, cement mixers, uh, clay kilns, blah, all these plans are open source. And a lot of that is funded on Kickstarter, um, which sort of makes me very grumpy when I do sort of see things, some of these technologies appearing up on, uh, on the news and media in the UK. This guy, I threw something at the TV when he came on and, um, and sort of uh, talked about 3D printing a bicycle. And uh, he said some really pompous things like, oh, this is why the government must sort of back big companies uh, because we have the technology and um, you know, back winners. Don't, don't spend your money on small companies. And... Um, Reality is actually while he's presenting that, you know, this is um, a rep wrap printer. There are, you know, lots of these kind of projects kicking around, um, and incredible amount of activity, incredible amount of contribution around that. Uh, to the extent there's um, a project called Pay It Forward, in which you are sent in the post, you know, bits of the rep wrap printer on the proviso. The first thing you do when you assemble your rep wrap printer is print another couple out and send them out to the people. And you know this 3D tech printing technology. I mean, some of this is laughable. This is a TED talk um, where this guy, you know, printed a kidney on stage. But that kind of gives you the kind of um, scale of things. I think we're almost at the point where you, your dentist could print your teeth rather than you know waiting for a, you know time to have one made. And you know the biology stuff. Well, that's, it's, I don't have the ability to grok what they're doing. It seems totally mad. Um, there's also an open dildo onyx uh, wiki, which you know. I'll leave to your imaginations. But um, there are some really kind of tangible things coming out of this. Uh, this is a $500 uh, PCR um, box, which uh, is a lab, uh, which will allow you to anal analyze uh, your sushi or your curry and tell you whether you really ate lamb last night or, or tuna. Um, so it'll do DNA analysis. Uh, you notice actually it's the aesthetic of these is um, they're made using laser cutters. And so 3D printers is quite exciting, but actually I think laser cutters are probably more empowering. 
uh, about a thousand pounds buys you an A4 laser cutter, which will cut plastic or uh, or, or you know um, uh, plywood. And here's um, you know this, is, this isn't open source necessarily, but it's kind of very uh, something that you anybody can do. Who can wield PowerPoint can create things. This is a rosary bead of the shipping forecast in the UK, so you can chant the fishing for shipping forecast. And uh, Brendan Dawes, who's quite a well-known uh, web designer in the UK. Um, is now you know one of a troop of people who are sort of wanting to sort of basically become product designers and 3D printers is really enabling this. Uh, this website, everything I made with my maker bot is really worth visiting. Anyway, so by, by and large, the thing that kind of interests me most is, is electronics. And electronics is really enabling. Uh, it's the Beagle board, a very affordable computer. Uh, the Bug Labs, a modular computer used by Ford and Accenture to um, you know to to encourage people to hack their cars. Um, Umlaut do a, a box, like an inventor's kit, which I think is available in Radio Shack in the States and you can buy from his website in the UK. Uh, and this is an Arduino sort of uh, kit. A, a very common use of Arduino is uh, seen here. This is from Russell Davies, um, a lovely thing. So basically he's got a picture frame by his front door and whether he can get a, a Boris bike um, is a green you know, light. So it's a really nice sort of bespoke piece of, uh, of things. But you can see that the actual, um, he's got an Arduino board and then an Ethernet uh, adapter, an Ethernet shield stuck on top. That is actually quite an expensive bit of kit. Um, so again, with open source, you know, you'd see two things that commonly used together, smooth them together, makes me nice. And so this is Ken Burke's um, take on that. Uh, he's pushed those two things together and made it very affordable, I think about 20 quid each. Ken's going to talk later. And then, you know, the Nanode is a very collaborative sort of um, bit of open source in the UK. And then you plug that into Patch Bay, which is like um, Twitter for things, and you've got um, some you know, ways of seeing what the world is around you. This is, um, again, a community response to Fukushima um, that actually uh, people didn't believe the radio monitoring from the government. So they basically, um, hackers in the hack space, built Geiger counters, open source designs, and then suddenly we had lots of Geiger counters on the ground, which could give you some information. And while I'm just sort of like saying these are wild and interesting things, um, white space is definitely something worth watching out for. Um, you know, here we're talking about a dollar chipset by 2014 for a, a low volume transmitter, uh, which will transmit miles and has a battery which lasts 14 years. Um, I think that's going to be transformative. We're going to see lots and lots of things relaying stuff out there. Um, right, so I'll just rattle through these last few slides because I think I'm probably running my time. But uh, just to say, it's one of my favourite Arduino hacks. This is, um, if anybody knows the language Occam, uh, which I was taught at university and I've always wanted to use in production. Um, this is uh, two Arduino boards, a uh, concurrent CC board, um, running Occam on each board. And so the, the, in the transputer world, which is where Occam comes from, the, the communications was by plugging chips together. It's just down a serial line. And um, David May, who's the inventor of the transputer and the language Occam, uh, spoke at one of our Oshugs. And he's got, got a chip called XMOS. And this kind of like really gives you a hint to the future that um, this is like an amazing bit of kit. Um, basically, you can turn any of those pins to do anything you want. So you can make that a single board computer. You can say those pins are the VGA, those are the keyboard, those are the network. Or you can actually just make it do whatever you want. And it's totally asynchronous. So unlike a, an Intel chip, which just every time there's a clock chip, every gate is flipping over. And that's why they get very hot. This does nothing until it needs to do something. Some signal comes in. And so it uses virtually no power while it's, while it's idle. But then actually when things burst into life. And we're seeing people actually trying to build data centers uh, and you know, EC2 kind of uh, in a box from this kind of device. And it's really transformative. Another transformative technology, which is quite old, but um, um, is FPGAs, which is a way of actually building, um, it's a bit like bubble wrap. You've got like a blank chip that does nothing, but then using software uh, at boot time, it can actually then say, okay, that's a NAND gate, that's an OR gate. And the outcome of that is a project called Open Cores, where any process you can think of um, there's an open source project to build it in FPGA, so Spark, Intel, ARM, blah, blah, blah. So software is, you know, smooshing between software and hardware is kind of happening. 
Uh, to the extent that this guy here uh, felt bad that he had an IBM 36, uh, 360 Model 30 in his, in his, in his shed and his mum threw it out. And uh, so he made his penance by recreating an IBM 30, uh, 360 Model 30 in, uh, in FPGA and open sourcing it. Now, the op another obstacle course to um, kind of open source hardware is, is blooming heck, lawyers. So, it, you know, doctors, you would worry about doctors who want to perpetuate disease, but lawyers who perpetuate laws, they're seen as doing a good job. And, you know, there's, there are very few sort of um, more depressing statements than the patented solution, because that's just saying, don't copy this. As in this piece of paper, which is gray, with white lines on it, is a patented solution, apparently. You know, that's just fantastic. And this thing, actually, I've got one in my pocket. It's a map, and it's kind of cool. It's supposed to be like a Google Maps, you know, that explodes. Uh, but they make big sort of noise about it being patented, so you can't copy that. And somehow um, we sort of think that's okay, that's normal, that, that ideas are sort of protectable. Patents are really problematic, unlike copyright. Uh, we can't, there's no copy left for patents because they cost money to make and you belong to a person and it's just much more cumbersome. So there's no kind of... Um, way of sort of diffusing a patent, and if patents protect things, you know, you're, there's no way of sort of me saying, here's an idea, and it's open for copying, like there is with copyleft. And that's kind of like, you know, bonkers, because in the real world, um, it depends on the application, you know, whether something sort of you is protected or not. You know, we don't stop people from passing recipes around. You know, sure, we stop people from copying Jamie Oliver's books, but the recipe isn't, you know, patented, isn't copyable. And you know some industries uh, actually, um, as Jonah Bakley sort of showed in another TED talk, um, some industries actually actually thrive on copying. Fashion is based on copying, and that's why you actually see a lot of um, designer stuff having trademarks in it, like in the belt or uh, you know um, in the in sort of in the, the style of the bag, because trademarks are obviously a way of stopping people from copying stuff. And there's a nutcase. Um, I don't think you'd mind me calling because. Um, he, he, this guy is really... That's a bit understated, Paul. Uh, yeah. I, dangerously, you know, dangerously out there. But he's built this thing called a hexayurt, which is like um, a building, which I think it was like 300 at, at Burning Man. Um, and, um, and it's, you know, sort of like a disaster relief shelter, vastly undercuts, undercuts what UNICEF and the gang pay for tents which blow away. Uh, but his ethos is... This should be like tying a shoelace. How to build a hexia is just some knowledge that we all have. It's not something you have to patent it or, or prevent people from doing. And that's the value. And, you know, in the UK, there's a lot of excitement around Raspberry Pi. Um, I don't want to sort of diss it because it's a lovely bit of kit. But you can just tell the problems they've got, which is... Um, the they don't reply to email. I, I think, actually, they've got a denial of service attack because it had so much publicity. Um, but... You know, for one thing, it's not an open source project, but that's that's for all sorts of reasons. One thing is it's, it's a Broadcom chip, and Broadcom don't have to necessarily have a best pedigree with Linux and open source. It runs Linux, um, but you know, just it's it's got some codecs in there to do audio and and um, and digital and video stuff, and you know, for them as a supplier to pay the licenses for that is fine. Um, you know, they could just treat it like another component on the board. You know, here's, here's 60 pence for capacitors, here's one pound 20 for the, um, the, the to Dolby for the AAC, you know, codec or whatever. But for an open source project, that's really hard because you can't pay Dolby that money. You're not an organization. So if you download the source plans that, you can't build the thing legitimately. And so that's really the problem with patents. And, you know, really, I, 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 I'm, I'm probably getting close to running on my time. But, um, yeah, will I do this? Oh, okay. So just give me, give me five minutes, I'll wrap up. So basically, I would just say there's a, lot, there's a difference between a license and the intention behind a license as well. And something I'm kind of shocked by is um, the immaturity of open source developers. So people put things up under Creative Commons licenses. And then when somebody's... Uh, it's happened a few times recently, people have built that into a commercial product. And then they've come along and said, well, hang on. You know, I'd like some money for that. Uh, you, you're using all my effort. And you know, we're really what they meant to wanted to do was saying non-commercial, which is not an open source license, as we know. And the, the, the final kind of thing I would would say really is that the kind of the, the problem with open source stuff in general is just design. 
design artifacts, which is what you want to fork and what you want to clone and, and, uh, and build patches around. Because you know, an open, a successful open source project is one where the instigator becomes an editor. You know, they've moved from actually writing the thing to actually accepting people's contributions and deciding whether they're good or not. And so here's a badge uh, with open source hardware. The GitHub repository has a single file in it, a DST, of which you need a commercial license to actually understand, and you know, a big blob of binary. And you know, the, the kind of uh, there are people trying to address that, like you know, knitting people have got built a, their own you know uh, XML, which has got like a DSL for it. Um, you know, and you know, just but suppose this is my kind of um, my kind of background, which is really that that um, to communicate things is not new, you know, and yet we don't do a very good job of that. Dumping a binary file on GitHub is not as good as you know sort of showing a circuit diagram, some explanation, some bill of materials, and some, you know, some drawings. And we don't see a lot of that in open source hardware. So that, that, was, that was going back to my solar pad, you know, where I started from, uh, which is basically what, that's what we hoped to do, was to build like an online data sheet for each project with bill of materials and, uh, and blah. And, you know, um, that's kind of another thing I would sort of just, just kind of warn against is, um, is Git is, not well understood outside of GitHub. So we've had a couple of people say to us, you forked my GitHub project onto your own website. And so when you fork a GitHub, when you take a Git repository and you clone it, you get all the history and everything. And so if you put it back on your own website, a few people said, well, I don't mind you forking on GitHub, but I didn't want you to put it on your website. And so that's again another sort of like lesson in sort of, um, in just, just warning about sort of, uh, when people sort of talk about you know things which are cool, I mean Lego is very very cool, uh, but we do have like a thing in our brain which sort of like cool stops us thinking what's going on here. It's a single supplier with uh, who are very hot on copyright and protection, and I guess the epitome of that is is Apple, um, which you know we've seen the biological elements this, and we've seen um, the fact that Apple like your phone to be a, an unscrewable uh, connection between your phone in your pocket to iTunes, your credit card and iTunes. Um, that's the kind of world we've got to rail against. That's why we should be able to fork stuff and build stuff. Okay, thank you. That's, that's my talk.